WGTK gives you Let's Talk with Dr. Stan Frager. From relationship problems to family feuds, he's got all the advice and expert help you'll need. Now, here's Dr. Stan Frager. Hi, welcome everyone. Nice. Don't even surprise me. Hi. I'm psychologist Stan Frager, and every Sunday night we get together from 8 until 9, and it's just great being with you. Tonight, you better keep it right here, because you're going to find this very, very interesting. And um, first of all, joining us is uh, Zach Fortier, who uh, uh, Mr. Fortier has written several books. You'll hear about them, but all having to do with police work. Talk a lot about police work. Today we've had lots of issues in our Louisville area. Uh, hopefully things are under control, which they seem to be, which is a nice thing. And uh, Mr. Fortier is going to talk a lot about his personal experience as well. He was serving as a police officer. Uh, well, also with this is Major Kelly Jones. Okay. And Miss Jones is with us, by the way, which is very nice. His daughter, and so it's very nice to have you with us. Okay. And the good friend, Dr. Eli Karam, is here. And uh, Dr. Karam is the immediate past president of the National Organization of American Family Therapists. He is a tenured professor from the University of Louisville in the Kent School of Social Work. And so it's great to have you with us. That's right. You know, it's Mother's Day, but I'm here with my radio, a father, Stan Frank. Oh, smooth. So, no, six years now on this radio show, and, uh, you know, I've been uh, always nice to be part of the Sunday family, and we're here talking right. about uh, police work and uh, and major changes and things going on. So I look forward to uh, being here this That's hour. That's great. Dr. Karen was right from the beginning. We started the day after Derby um, about six years ago. So it's, we're into our seventh year here, WGTK. Um, Mr. Fortier, tell me about, I know you started in the Air Force as an MP. Tell me a little bit about what you did over the last 30 years as a police officer and how you think, what's, what's the major difference between police officer and police work today versus 20 years ago, 30 years ago? Um, well, I started out as an MP in the Air Force and basically was guarding uh, nuclear weapons and then transitioned to uh, deputy sheriff and then to the city police officer in the state that I grew up in. And uh, as far as the changes, I think people have become really de- dependent upon technology, tasers, pepper spray, and a lot less dependent upon human contact. I think they've, they've become so, more dependent. You mean? Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, right. really dependent upon computers, pepper spray, uh, tasers, staying in the car, responding as quickly as possible, and a lot less human contact. That's yeah, my yeah now, Major Kelly, your your head was going up and down. See, if we were television, you'd have no problem seeing it. His head looked like a bobblehead, didn't he? It? It's going up and down. Exactly. Well, what do you think? Mr. Fortier's right on the money. How's that apply in our local area? Yeah, Zach's right. And I think it's a culture issue, you know, that this generation is uh, learning to communicate in ways that are very different from before. And uh, I think you take each one of those uh, individual examples separately. You know, yes, we we depend on tasers. And I think probably the research has found we try to do that to limit injuries to both citizens and police officers. And computers it has made our lives faster and, and certainly probably tonight we'll talk about some of the technology but zach is right the number one change in in, in even in culture and in, in media in policing certainly has to be the use of technology in many many areas uh, so gentlemen is that a good thing or a bad thing i guess probably certainly with uh more technology comes uh different types of problems so as far as the to training of officers and, and maintaining uh active police forces, that technology a good thing or a bad thing? Well, I can tell you from my perspective, I'm sorry, Zach, from... from, Go ahead, go ahead. I I think you want to talk first. (laughs) I I think the thing that we have to be sure of is that we recognize and understand uh, today's culture and generations and make sure that at the academy level and on the everyday 
street level that we appropriately train our officers and that they do understand. And uh, one of the things I think is difficult, we have to make officers understand that, you know, you can't react emotionally or in situations by hitting the exclamation point on your phone. You have to be prepared to understand how to talk to folks and how to engage people and and we're just different in our culture so we have to be aware of what the challenges are and prepare officers to indeed engage people in conversation from other words besides i can tell uh major jones you got some good interpersonal skills but do do you think that is a a lost art in the academy and whatever i have uh uh several of my clients certainly have a one close friend is a indiana uh policeman and, and uh he was he's pretty interpersonally skilled but uh, i wonder if you think that's a lost art in the training of uh the police force i don't think we've lost it i think as a matter of fact we've focused more on it because we understand it I, and i think the art certainly exists in society but it's just a matter of how much do we practice it and and how much do we need to do to make folks understand because it is a challenge you you can't put people in situations where you have to talk to people, and if they haven't ever had the responsibility to do that. And, and, and I think we're speaking more to the younger generation mm-hmm. versus a lot of folks that have been on the job for many years. Mm-hmm. What do you think, Zach? Uh, I, I agree with part of that. I, I really think that uh, you, you can stress it in the academy, but I think, you know, once you leave the academy, I mean, everybody will tell you, you know, the academy is where you learn everything, but the reality is the academy is a starting place. When you leave the academy, you, the department has totally different demands, expectations, and, and then the street itself is an entirely different world that I really don't think you can train for. You have to experience. In your book, you've, but, you're different. But this is what, your third book now? Which one? Let's see, the one I, I read, uh, Curb Street. Street Cred? Curb, yeah, Curbs. Curb okay, check. there's Curb Check, Street curb Cred, check. Curb Check Reload, and Hero to Zero. Right. So I know that, for example, a good friend of mine is the uh, EAP director for the Kentucky State Police, Dr. Mm-hmm. Uh, Dr. Um, Beeble. And, for example, he handles the, what happens after a shooting. Right. I think people get the impression, we'll let Mitch Kelly talk about the fact that it's, that's her, um, Major Jones. We'll talk about the fact that uh, when somebody gets shot, it doesn't just suddenly end. They show up, make a quick report. There's a lot goes on afterwards. And police officers, there's good reason that they usually give them a desk job, administrative job, right? Yeah, there's a whole lot of things to that. And that's why you see, you know, one of one of the units that we have and is, is under my current command is peer support. And... The best thing that you can do for folks in those situations, at least in my opinion, you have to have a group of professionals that understand how to take it from that moment forward, and you also have to connect them with folks who have perhaps been down that road and can help someone uh, understand how to experience the trauma. And that, that trauma goes both ways for the victims, for the families, for the police officer. It goes across a broad spectrum, and they certainly need access to folks who know how to go down that road. Okay, we'll take um, just a short little break, and we'll, then we'll talk about some of the things that happen. And I, I think you can find Zach Fatir's book really, really interesting in some of his experiences, as I'm sure Major Jones has a couple himself. All right. I'm Dr. Sam Frager, and Dr. Karen will keep everybody, keep us all straight. Be right back. Dr. Howard, Dr. Fine, Dr. Frager. You found Let's Talk with Dr. Stan Frager. Dr. Stan Frager is standing by to give you insight on issues that matter most to you. Call now, 571-0970. Hi, Hi and welcome. Psychologist Stan Frager, we Sunday night. We gather from 8 to the 9 o'clock hour. And we have uh, three really outstanding individuals with us tonight. Zach Frater. He's written a lot about police work over the last 30 years and served as uh, 30 years as an officer. And then from Louisville, we have Major Kelly Jones, who uh, is uh, the lieutenant, is in charge of a lot of different units, including um, SWAT team and bomb unit and air unit. It's like if we can't find someone to take charge of this, we know where we can throw it. So, 
So, um, Zach, let's talk a little bit about, um, we've talked about how things have changed. Um, do you think there ought to be higher penalties or lesser penalties for crimes in America? Um, I, I think really the, the reality is we use the law to fix all of our social issues. I, I don't think increasing penalties or, or decreasing penalties or writing more laws is going to really fix anything. Um, I think we have to change the way we view things as a society as far as crime and, and what needs to be punished and how. For example, where the state I was in, uh, when when I started, uh, shoplifting was a misdemeanor, which basically was not a lot of time. And uh, the retailers uh, got with the legislature and basically got laws passed that after five convictions of shoplifting, it became a felony, and, and now you were going to do serious time. And I, I just can't see that that makes sense to make something like shoplifting a felony. The, the and you just keep increasing penalties and you keep imprisoning people. And Yeah, we lock up, the America locks up more people than any percentage-wise than any right. other country in America. But our crime rate is not less. We're way... It doesn't do any good. It's proven it doesn't do any good. Exactly. I mean, the data doesn't There needs support. to be a better way to deal with it. It needs to be a more progressive way. I mean, old school is punish. And obviously it doesn't work. We need to come up with a better way to deal with it, a more effective way. Major, what do you think? Uh, and I think Zach is right. We can't, you know, we hear folks say we can't legislate our way out of a problem. Well, we can't punish our way out of a problem either because, you know, if you... If that's the only way we can do things, then it, then if it applies to everything, you know, it's something as simple as if, if 70 is speeding and 75 is too dangerous, and what do we do when you go 80? And if that's not enough, what do we do when you go 90? And eventually uh, you, you box yourself into a corner where you don't address the root cause of anything uh, and you don't get to, to the very basics of what causes a problem. You just can't penalize your way out of any type of problem. Exactly. And then... Uh, along with that is the fact that uh, not only do we lock up more people, but there aren't enough jails to lock everybody up that does something wrong. There aren't enough. We can't. We couldn't build them fast enough. Much less to say anything about having the money to support them. By the way, our lines are open. We welcome your calls. Five seven one zero nine seventy puts you right here. Five seven one. And just like the radio station, 0970. You know, gentlemen, I'm listening to this, and we, we talk a lot about work-life balance uh, on this show. And it's one thing if you're working a desk job or an office job and you come home to your, your wife and kids. It's another thing if you're a law enforcement officer and you've been exposed to a lot of stuff. So I, I guess I'm curious what you think about uh, how to maintain a work-life balance and really the stresses of the job, especially um, being exposed and being desensitized really to violence or to some really uh, horrific things that the everyday person is not going to see that could be part and parcel of the job of a law enforcement officer. So what do you think about uh, work-life balance as far as uh, the right way to do that for uh, a police officer? You know, we talk about that a lot, and, and it gives me the opportunity to say, Happy Mother's Day to my mom, who's listening in Jacksonville, Florida, along go. with my stepdad, Steve, and, and also a shout-out to Carrie tonight for Mom's Day. And, and you know, it, a lot of that has to do with the way you're brought up, the way you're raised, your life's experiences, uh, your emotional maturity, and, and different type things. I was very fortunate. Um, I always felt like I was a strong person, mostly due to what the things that my parents had taught me. But... Uh, I was always able to separate it. A lot of folks can't do that as well as others. I was able to leave it at the doorstep when I got home and pick it up when I walked out the door. You know, it's uh, kind of like being in costume, I used to say. But you have to, the, the key to me is you have to learn to laugh in life, even sometimes when the circumstances are tough. You don't laugh at a situation, but you have to find something in your life that is enjoyable, something that is humorous. You have to learn the basic needs you have to understand family uh, that our basic needs for being cared about and loved and how to handle and connect with people mm -hmm. you have to certainly you know you proper sleep proper exercise things they've been telling us for years and years but everybody has to have a system to do something that they like to do 
that takes them away from the things that sometimes cause them discomfort. Well, and then that's part of that, though, the part that uh, discomfort here in the greater Louisville area, we had an incident where a couple hundred uh, young people got together and just went on a rampage. Now, I can just hear the mayor the next day talking to the chief saying, that will never happen again. That's the end of that. And what does it take? Now, the question is, these were like mm, predominantly 11 through 18-year-olds, mm -hmm. major. Is that about right? Yeah, I think there were a couple older ones in the mix. Yeah, but I mean, out of the 200, sure. most of them were in that age bracket. Yeah. Just mostly middle school, a few high school. Yeah. And the issue, can't you hear that discussion the next day or that night? With them? Because then what happens and plays in the back of people's head when they go downtown is don't go downtown at night. It's not safe. Yeah. And that kills a city. Right. And I, would, and I would disagree with the notion that it's not because it is safe to go downtown. And it's a vibrant place. And I think the thing about that night is something happened quickly and it developed and got it got out of hand from the, the, those kids' perspective in a very, very quick time. And we we got there, we addressed it, we dissipated it, and something like that happens so fast that, uh, you know, you, I don't think it's always fair to judge by uh, were we Johnny on the spot right then. It took a few minutes to get there and get the situation under control. Uh, but it's just something that escalated very quick, and sometimes you you like to think you plan for the worst and the and the things that provide you the most challenges every day. But sometimes things just happen quickly, and you have to temper and plan your response. And as you can see, we made it through so many derby events and so many things now where there wasn't any problems. And I think that's indicative of the good work of our citizens, people coming together, and the police department. It happened in a hurry. Yeah, uh, I want to get back to that, Zach, to that first question. You you have, uh, I think, been in, in your writing pretty open about your um, your struggles uh, with PTSD as a result of the stressors of your work, and I guess I am curious how you find that balance, just like I asked Major Jones, and, and really if you can tell us, because uh, I think a lot of people... Uh, you know, you believe to be a law enforcement officer, you have to be uh, strong and hard and tough, and of course you do, but it's also very brave to kind of come out and talk about something like PTSD. So uh, uh, anything you have to tell uh, the listeners about that, I'm and sure that could help a lot of people And what would you add to what Dr. Karam just said? Um, well, you know, I, I agree with uh, your other guest. Um, you do come into it with a series of coping skills and, and, and weaknesses and strengths. And the reality is, I think, uh, for me personally, I didn't realize I had PTSD and the effect it had on me until I was on a call and I could not make sense out of what the person was telling me. And the more they talked, the more it became gibberish. And I sat down in my car and I couldn't read anything in the car. It was like suddenly it all came down at once. Um, so cognitively, whatever happened at that moment affected me, and I, it took me several days just to be able to read a sentence. It just hit me all at once. How far into your career was that, Zach? Uh, probably about 18 years. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, I was crippled. I, I, mean, I couldn't tell anybody yeah, about it. colleagues because... think you're just malingering. Excuse me? You, you know, the colleagues, I dealt the last uh, eight years on suicide in the Army. If you go oh. to get mental health help, one of the biggest problems is stigma. And it's like, oh. you know, we're tough, we're there. And, yeah, and I didn't have any of that. I, I sought treatment immediately. I knew, you know, pretty much knew I was in trouble. I went and got help. I, I was in a couple shootings in the department. Uh, had kind of a bare minimum uh, two or three days with a psychologist, and you were good to go, and you were back on the street. And uh, I knew that wasn't the case. I knew I was in trouble. And it, it actually took me uh, probably a good eight years to work through it and, and get back to where I could be somewhat emotionally healthy, and I, I had to leave the department and leave the area and leave all the triggers that kept setting it off. I just couldn't stay. 
What do you think, Major Jones? I, I think the most important thing of what Zach said is he knew he was in trouble. And I think sometimes that we think as police officers that we're supposed to wear a cape and a mask every day and every night. And and you cannot do that. You have to be um, man or woman enough, as the case may be, to admit that, you know what, I think something's wrong. And it's okay that I have emotional issues or I think that there's a problem. That That's called the human experience, the human equation. And it's all right to be that way. That is, you know, they say the, the most important part is recognizing you need help. We have to encourage people to understand that just by nature of this job doesn't mean that we're superhuman. We have to know when the red flag goes up. And on the, by the same token, on the other side, when we reach out, they have to be very receptive and say, you know, it is a good thing. It's fine. We will help you get through this or that. And there's no negative stigma attached to it. We thank you and applaud you for saying that you needed a little boost up. Yeah, we, you know, in the field have a lot of techniques. Uh, well, we'll hear the music playing, so we'll come back. I want to ask you more about your uh, your treatment and your uh, eventual triumph uh, over PTSD, Zach. So you're listening to uh, Let's Talk with Dr. Stan, and we'll see you in two minutes. Hey, he's a natural, right? I love it. Let's Talk with Dr. Stan Frager, helping you make sense of life's daily challenges and much more on 970 WGTK. Dr. My eyes have seen the year and the slow parade of fears without crying. Now I want to understand. Dr. My eyes. Okay, hi, welcome. I'm psychologist Stan Frager with Dr. Eli Karam with Major Kelly Jones of the Louisville Police Department, and Zach Fortier, author extraordinaire. Kind of, in your book, you, you kind of tell it like it is. Yeah, that, that was the point. Yeah, and in telling it like it is. The reality of it. Yeah, so before the break we were talking about, for, for those that don't know, a lot of your book is destigmatizing kind of mental health uh, issues around law enforcement officers and when you need to get help. And you were telling us, before the break that you did get help and why don't you tell the um, the listener out there Zach what that multi-year uh, treatment was like getting you back to a place uh, where you could feel like yourself again kind of working through the PTSD well it, it was really like uh, I mean it, the only thing I can give you is an analogy it was like having a really serious injury and uh, trying to rehab and trying to find out what it was that uh, would trigger it and and then minimize those triggers and it was very much kind of a no matter what i mean i, I know you'd like me to say that you know counseling did all kinds of stuff for me it, it really didn't i had to kind of figure it out on my own that what foods triggered it what sounds triggered it what movies triggered it and then avoid it and the less triggers i had like for example with caffeine or uh stimulant of any kind um, loud noises, uh, being in a neighborhood that reminded me of a neighborhood that I had been in when there was a shooting or a significant incident. I just basically had to remove all the triggers so that... Do we get that in our police department? I could heal. Here in Louisville, Major. Well, I think every every single person is different. That's why we all have a different DNA makeup. and. You know, like we said earlier, Zach knew when he was in trouble, and then, um, you know, he said it, it, it wasn't necessarily the cure-all for him. I hope that his experience was that whoever helped him put him on somewhat the right track to go down to help him understand what those triggers were because, uh, you know, we can give folks a lot of encouragement and help, and in the end, it, it's a mixture of taking professional advice and understanding what our part in everything is and i would hope that somewhere and if not it's it's a shame that uh, i hope someone put him on the right track to at least understand some of the things he had to do an unseen guest tonight is reagan jones hi nice thanks for having jones. me yeah nice Nice to have you here. Now, Regan uh, told us on the break she is uh, going to be in the advanced standing program at the University of Louisville Kent School of Social Work. She's going to go into helping profession where those interpersonal skills, much like your dad has, are, are very much necessary. So, Regan, I was wondering, you know, we talked about your dad's perspective of what it takes to be successful uh, as far as this work-life balance. Well, what has your been experience of having a father who very successful at what he does during the day and also, you know, leading uh, 
lots of units, squat teams, things like that. Do you ever worry about dad's safety growing up? And then uh, what is your perspective as the adult daughter of a, a police officer? Oh, absolutely. Um, I was actually lucky enough. Uh, I didn't only have one police parent. I had two. Oh. So my mother is a police officer as well. Wow. Um, so I grew up very uh, protected, I guess, you know. But um, to be honest Let me with guess, you, nobody bullied you. Yeah. <laughs> um, it was definitely, prom was kind of scary. Uh -huh. uh, you yeah. can imagine, but. Yeah, can you see him showing up at the door, two police officers are standing at the door. Come in, we want to talk to you yeah. first before you go out <laughs> with right. our daughter. Yeah, but yeah, I'm sure, yeah, when you were a little girl that, you know, you were worried about mom and dad. Oh, yeah, um, definitely. I definitely had concerns, um, but they were they were always very um, confirming to me and always encouraging, always there for me. You know, I never felt like I came second. Um, I knew that my parents had a job to do, and yes, there were times when they came home and they were very stressed um, and they were, um, you know, concerned about their, their responsibilities, but never did they put um, their family second, and I just hope... Um, you know, sometimes there's a stigma um, when people don't understand the job and they're quick to criticize police work. Um, but I hope that people do understand that here in Louisville and across the nation, um, we have officers that are just giving 100% all the time, um, should be recognized and, and appreciated. Yeah, what bothers me is um, I, I spent 10 years as a Los Angeles probation officer, and we never hear about civilian brutality. We always hear mm. about police brutality. But I can tell you from being out on the street and then traveling on the street with different officers that uh, some of the abuse they take is unbelievable and they handle it in a professional kind of way rather than lashback. Because most civilians, if, if somebody said to you the kinds of things that these officers get hurled at them, you'd want to go at them, you'd jump for their throat. Mm -hmm. what, what do you think, Zach? I, I I would agree. I think a lot of times uh, you do want to jump for the throat, and I think it it happens. I think, but sometimes there right is now. police brutality. There's, there's police officers who abuse their authority. I'm sure, uh, 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 Ms. Jones. What do you think about that, Major Jones? Uh, well, certainly they do, and you know, and if we knew well, the reason that one person did it and one didn't, we figure out a way to stop that, and it's it's difficult to know. And, and sure, there are times when um, it's an affront to you as a human being. It's not even as a policeman; it's an affront to you as a human being, the way you're talked about. But when you raise your right hand, you're you take an oath to uphold the Constitution of the United States, and sometimes. You do things, and you 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 have to be there to protect everybody's interest. You know, this side may shout out you, that side may shout out at you. People uh, challenge your authority, but you you we expect more from our officers. We expect more from ourselves. We have to work harder to make sure that we don't lose our cool, that we don't lose our temper. And I've told officers for many many years that sometimes the most powerful weapon that you have. Uh, becomes your ink pen. Write down the facts of what happened. Write down the story of your life. Use your pen to be your most important weapon. It's not some of the other things you have. But yeah, it's insulting as a person, not just as a policeman, but you just have to hold yourself to a higher standard and get past it. You know, Dr. Cameron, one of the things that uh, police officers and probation officers uh, dislike the most is breaking up family disputes. You walk into a home, yeah. More officers get hurt breaking up family disputes than just about anything else. That's true in most cities, not every city, but almost all of them. Yeah, I was going to ask these guys, uh, uh, of all the, the calls they made, of, of all the disputes they've been a part of, this idea of what, what really has hit the kind of closest to home, what are the things that no matter how long you do this, you never get used to, that it really takes a unique type of... Uh, distress tolerance or really good skills to kind of to regulate because it would really sit with you. Uh, what are the toughest type of situations that you've been in, uh, Major Jones? Well, for me, it's anything that involves children. There's just no doubt about it. Uh, a child who perhaps was helpless in a situation or wasn't old enough to have the proper skills to work with a situation. Um, People always ask me what's one of the worst things that ever happened to you. And it, it was truly, it was a car wreck where a child was struck and killed. And it, it, you 
that has carried with me for many many years but anything that affects children uh is part is for me is the most difficult because sometimes they they weren't old enough to have a chance in life they they couldn't fend for themselves and you you look at lives lost lives shattered by things that happened to children and those are the ones that have stuck with me through the years i'd, I'd like to hear about the uh, zach frater and major jones and your take uh, dr karen on the fact that um one of the pitches that gangs make, one of the reasons I left Los Angeles was to get away from all the gang activity. And now I notice it's following me. I see all these buildings tagged and all these things starting to get tagged. What is our approach? What are we going to do? Because the gang's attitude is, see, you got no papa, you got no mama. We're your family. We're your they sing that song a lot. And so the issue then gets to be the gangs start getting bigger and bigger and stronger. And what are, what are we doing about it in Louisville? What do, you, what do we do about it nationally? Uh, Mr. Fortier, what do you think? Um, well, I, I'd have to disagree with you. I don't think that the, the gang assumes a parental role. I think that the gang fits um, a need that basically everybody has, and whether you recognize it or not, people that affiliate themselves so strongly with a sports team that they get in a fight outside of a game is basically gang behavior. Um, it's basically identifying yourself with a color or a flag or whatever you want to call it. Oh, absolutely. The, the worst that, thing can happen to you is be wearing the wrong color in some neighborhoods. Right. In some yeah. of those neighborhoods, right. You get shot for it. Right, um, but that also happens at football games and that happens at high school football games and it, it, it's it's not anything to do with whether or not your parents raised you right or raised you wrong. I, I've known several gang members that I've arrested, I've put in prison, and I've maintained friendships with that had great family. Oh, but yeah, gang kids uh, uh, habilitate and uh, acclimate to uh, institutional life real quick. We'll be right back. 5710970. I'm Dr. Stan Krager. It's always nice to have you with, uh, with us on Sunday nights. So keep it right here. We'll be right back. Calling Dr. Howard, Dr. Fine, Dr. Frager. You found Let's Talk with Dr. Stan Frager. Dr. Stan Frager is standing by to give you insight on issues that matter most to you. Call now, 571-0970. Hi, right, welcome. Very nice. Uh, by the way, you want to really check out an interesting book, this Curb Check um, Reloaded by Zach Fortier. Fortier being F-O-R-T-I-E-R. Really an excellent book. And it's an easy read, very enjoyable. It is, and uh, uh, Zach has uh, written several other books. Uh, what would you say, uh, Curb Check, uh, the biggest difference between Curb Check uh, Reloaded, which is your newest one, right, and the other books you've written, Zach? Um, I'd, I'd say it's probably uh, more brutal, a lot more honest, and um, it's, it's after I was pretty screwed up. I knew I was damaged, and just writing about that and how it was and uh, the narrative like you said you uh kind of did this work on yourself you identified your triggers and you moved forward and it, i think you know we on the show like to connect with strength and health even in the most adverse circumstances so what is uh for those of kind of preview of the book what is the moral of the story how did you other than getting out of the environment, what are the pearls of wisdom to take from how you rehabilitated your life and obviously has gone on to have a successful career now as an author? Uh, I think you just you just got to realize that it, the way you were is, is not going to be there again. Um, you don't try and get back to it. You try and heal just much, as much like a, a professional athlete. You realize you do have an injury and you have to recover and you have to rehabilitate and you may not be 100%. You may be 70 or 80 or 90, but you can press on. Kind of like the new normal, we might call right, it. Right, exactly, exactly. How, uh, Amir, with uh, obviously uh, Major Kelly Jones and his daughter Reagan, we're talking a lot about the, their family life. What uh, what was the effect of this? This, is, this was job-related PTSD. What was it? the effect of uh, your work trauma on your close interpersonal relationships, both family and friends? Well, it, it basically... it was devastating um i went through several marriages uh I'm, I'm not a drinker or a smoker so i couldn't you know say that that was an issue it was basically just that i was i was 
shattered and I had to regroup and I didn't have a support system that uh, could do that. So I, I basically I got married, I got divorced until I found somebody that could actually deal with where I was and what I was going through and I have an excellent support system now, but at the time I did not. And did that come with a lot of education, obviously, the person you're with now as far as from you on what you've been through and, and what you needed as far as support? A lot of people try to be helpful. They don't understand the disorder. They can actually uh, uh, be the, the opposite of that, not helpful, and right, cause right. some of those and triggers. So how did you go about, I guess the book would be a good way to let your, your spouse read that, but how did you go about getting that support from your, your network that you have now? I think it was, it, I just got really lucky and, and, and found uh, a woman that would listen and not just listen, but understand and hear. It, it's one thing to talk and communicate and share your feelings. It's another thing to actually sit down and hear what's being said and then take action to, to do something about it and not provoke and not constantly try and create drama. Drama just sets me off. Well, are there things not being taught in law enforcement academies that you think should be taught? I, I personally think that academies need to go back to more of a communicative thing. Uh, and I really think police departments, they really need to teach officers how to listen. I had a guy tell me early on after uh, I basically got a gang leader to become an informant on his own gang and, and I was talking to the sergeant in gangs and he said you know you do something I haven't seen done in a long time and I thought he was ridiculing me and he said no I'm serious you you talk to people like they're people and we just don't do that anymore we're all about do as I say I'm in charge this is my authority I'm in control and in my point of view you were never in control you were always reacting Mr. Jones, what about in our Louisville Academy? Yeah, we, I, I think that at LMPD, we're doing an excellent job of that. And, you know, and, and I can't speak for a lot of the academies across the nation because I just don't know. But Zach is 100% right on. You know, people get uncomfortable when you put them in situations, even in training, where, you know, we would say, okay, Dr. Frager, it's your turn. Show us how you would talk to this person or handle this situation. And we get embarrassed or we don't like the spotlight being on us in front of other people and we don't practice it as much. But we've tried really hard to work on those interpersonal skills. And, I mean, that's the key to the nature of this job. It's all about people and it's about treating with people with respect and having the skills and abilities to to talk to people and Zach's right it's not about um, you know I've always told young people at the academy if, if I have to tell you to do it because I'm the boss or I say because I'm the boss and I said so then somewhere we failed the communication gap between and we were both responsible for that someone should leave your office feeling better than when they entered it and you treat those people like human beings and not like uh, means to an ends of production. And, and he's exactly right. It, we can't be so caught up in careerism that we forget the human equation. It just doesn't make for good leadership. Well, I guess I agree. For, for both of you, speaking of that, I mean, I think we, we call it bears on patrol or something. There was an astronomical number of, uh, of stuffed animals given to the police department, first responders in general, who respond and just like you mentioned, uh, Major, the, you, you had um, a, a child being killed it was terrible. But so often you go into situations in which children are injured or they're hurt. It isn't always a cops and robbers type of approach. And then they forget that things just like giving a child a stuffed animal. Those are important little things that, that counteract some of the stuff that we're talking about. And I still think it goes back to some of your life's experiences and the way you're raised and the things that you've learned. If you, you know, I hear a lot of people say, well, the job made me different. The job made me colder. The job shut me out to things. Maybe a little bit, uh, and I, I guess I have to agree with that a little bit. It might harden you a little bit to certain things, but if you came in with a decent skill set, then you got a, a great opportunity to work some of those skills in this job, and, and you're right. It, you. You either understand, you either empathize with people, or you don't have the ability to. You either understand a, a tear shed and know how to shed one with a child. You you stand at the scene and you you have to uh, feel. For me, I think as I've gotten older, 
Uh, it didn't get easier because I've seen, uh, you know, I think I've probably been to three or 400 traffic fatalities mm -hmm. in my career. They didn't get easier because I've done more of them. They got more difficult because as I've gotten older, I understand how important life is and how fragile. So now I shed a tear because someone lost a life. Versus. Now, you are a pretty authentic guy, Major Jones, I can tell, sitting, spending this hour with you. Now, do you think that most officers are trained to be that way too, a natural kind of just empathic, genuine response, or they're taught to stuff it down, not let it out? Because I think probably why you've uh, had the career you've had and lasted so long is you, you've known that part, which is that's part of release and not, like I said, suppressing all those feelings, letting it out in real time, which probably keeps you uh, regulated and able to, as you said earlier, have that work-life balance. Do you think uh, most officers are like that? Is a culture conducive to that or not? Well, I got to tell you, 27 years ago when I joined up with LPD, no one really talked about those things. I don't recall us ever even having that discussion about it. It was kind of more like uh, uh, you're the authoritative figure. You go in and fix it and get out. We didn't talk about our feelings and our, our communication skills and different things. And But also, you know, and I've said twice, it, it's your family. It plays into my, my faith, my ability to believe in something bigger than me and just in the human equation, as I've said. But, no, we didn't talk about it 27 years ago, and we do talk more about it now. But you also have to want to better yourself yeah. you can't just say it's not going to come to you you've got to want to get better with people now reagan i'm also you know experiencing your dad and i'm wondering uh as as a young girl and now as a uh, young woman also in a another type of service profession a helping profession going into social work is that something that you think your dad always had uh or do you think that has been enhanced over his years kind of doing the work or did you teach it to him <laughs> no uh, my dad has always been um I've, I've been so proud of him, um, and just his character um, is just true and true. Um, I think you guys said earlier, um, when we were talking about um, imprisonment, you were talking about the social issues are causing, you know, and we can't just fix it um, with legality. And, I, and I'm thinking here, um, I think I really appreciate people like Zach who, who put their story out there for people to read, because, you know, we are humans. We're not machines. We don't come with manuals. Um, we have to learn um, by observation, and we, we do learn from other people and from their experiences. And, you know, from, from a social worker's perspective, I think, um, it's helpful when officers um, recount, you know, the events in their lives and, and the things that make them who they are um, so we can help them. Yeah. And, and Zach, uh, you know, we, again, are, we're all very uh, fortunate to have you share your story. And I guess I'm wondering, uh, the writing these books and, as you said, being brutally honest, what was your hope both for other police officers and just for people in general that are being exposed to trauma either at work or at home? Um, well, I, geez, I don't know. <laughs> I really don't. You put, you put uh, it out there for a reason, though, so, uh, right, it must right. have been I, I wrote to it, do that. like, I, I, let me, I mean, a brief deal. I was contacted by a reporter who was doing the follow-up on, uh, the aftermath of shootings, and, uh, after we got done with the article, he said, hey, you should probably write a book, and we started out writing it together, and then he wanted to go fiction, and I did not, and we split parties right there and once I started this you know to be honest with you I wasn't really doing all that well um, it was really difficult to write I still was really cognitively impaired and it, it really helped and that's one of the reasons I kept going is because it became a real big part of the healing process well uh, it, it really has and I'm glad you were able to put that out there and again I, I hope you have the chance both uh, to the general public, but also specifically to law enforcement officers, to share that story and to destigmatize uh, kind of what you've gone through. And Stan, it's yeah, really, I've, yeah, I've had a lot of guys get a hold of me via email and stuff and tell me that you know they really appreciated that I wrote it, but also there's some really angry voices out there that really don't like the fact that it is out there. Yeah. I understand. Hey, thank you so much for being with us tonight. Thank you. I appreciate you having me and. Uh, if I could, I'd give a shout-out to my uh, publicist, Sally, and uh, my wife, Christina, for their support in, in doing all this. Hey, you got it. Thanks. Thank you. Bye-bye. All right. By the way, coming up, The Magic and the Wonder. It benefits Cousier Children. It's an incredible magic show coming down to the Kentucky Center for the Arts, and it's a week from tonight, May 18th. And uh, there's some discount tickets out there you can get at Wendy's. 
and so forth. And it's an amazing magic show. We have a very large magic core of people here in our greater Louisville area. And uh, this in particular, um, the magic show by itself has contributed over $200,000 for Corsair Kids. Really a nice thing. So if you get a chance, take it in Sunday night, and then on the way home, be sure and listen right here at 970 WGTK. Um, Major Jones, thank you, buddy. Thank you. It's been an absolute.